The Biden administration is shutting down its disinformation board. This after myriad issues from its controversial czar, Nina Yankovic, who famously was one of the uh, people saying that the Hunter Biden laptop story was Russian disinformation, uh, probably not a good viewpoint for the person who's going to police disinformation to hold. Nevertheless, uh, Washington Post reporter Taylor Lorenz, who broke the story, so she framed the board's demise as an accomplishment of right wing rhetoric. And I speed read through this story, which, again, I, I, I have appreciated some of Taylor's reporting in the past. Uh, this is a scoop that she got exclusively, so good for her. But how she frames this story, I find very suspect. So I, nowhere in this story, so it's all built around how, uh, like I'll read, the headline is how the Biden administration let right-wing attacks derail its disinformation efforts. So the framing of the story is that this is a very bad thing that has happened because the Tucker Carlson's and the Jack Posobiec's and I guess the risings of the world were you know, relentlessly against this woman and we're doing all sorts of personal attacks because we made fun of her TikTok videos. Nowhere in this story do the words Hunter Biden laptop appear. There is no acknowledgement in this story of, the, of what I think was extremely valid criticism of the person in this role was that she has a very selective in the past view of what is disinformation, that she fell for that same thing. And I, I think it's extremely irresponsible not to mention that at all in the story. Yeah, it's also stolen valor from the theater kid community. I mean, it was her big <laughs> theater energy that ultimately brought her down. We all know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I think that, you know, I don't, I haven't had a chance to read the story yet, but to the extent that they don't talk about the hearings that we discussed on this show and how poorly the uh, people were answering questions about how she was selected and whether or not there was any discussion of whether she was going to be able to handle uh, elements of misinformation coming from different political spheres in an unbiased way. I mean, that really is the story here. And I might have some more sympathy for her if that if it was, was just her vibes that were so off-putting to people. You know, I, I, as an acapella queen, will defend a theater queen. But at the end of the day, it's the substance. And it's a shame that that's not covered in the article. I mean, here, here are the first, yeah. the first two paragraphs. On the morning of April 27th, DHS announced creation of the Disinformation Governance Board. Blah, blah, blah. The Biden administration tapped Nina Yankovic, a well-known figure in the field of fighting disinformation and extremism. The next graph, they describe her as someone with extensive experience in the field of disinformation, which has er emerged as an urgent issue. Author of two books, How to Be a Woman Online, How to Lose the Information War. Her career also featured stints at nonpartisan think tanks. Within the small community of disinformation researchers, her work was well regarded. Like, how many, this is thrice <laughs> praising her. Again, a woman who got a very important, uh, and so did lots of other people, that's fine, but to never acknowledge that one of the reasons conservatives are innately skeptical. The, maybe the main reason of this kind of whole disinformation framing is that a lot of things that got labeled that way have, have proven to be much more complicated and worthy of discussion. The lab leak, a lot of other COVID stuff, and then, and then very much so the, uh, the laptop story. Liberalism well, means also, never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important also to point out that this wasn't really just about her. I mean, if they're shutting down the entire disinformation governance board, then it wasn't just about her and replacing her because she's got problems and she has mm. this, you know, history of not exactly being, um, you know, uh, bipartisan or or at least not part nonpartisan. So they're shutting down the entire board. This is a good thing. Obviously, I think that they received a lot of pressure when it came to uh, from from people in Congress questioning, saying, why are we having this board? And, and it was a really good question. It's beyond this woman. What was the purpose of this disinformation governance board? What were they going to do? They said they didn't have any policing power, but they were to they they answered to the Department of Homeland Security, which certainly is a, is a, a department that has policing power. So what were what was this board even going to do? Right. In my opinion, it couldn't be shut down fast enough. Thank goodness they they did. I mean this. And we sh and we and actually we should clarify that they've only said it's being paused. Paused. Uh, now right. in the world world of government agencies, you know, are they going to restart it? Who knows? I, I would think it's unlikely. And I the pause I is basically because of the backlash. But again, the story is saying the backlash was that's ba that's a what a what a shame that this backlash has caused this result. I mean, you could right you could entirely reconstruct this as a like democratic accountability. The people spoke out against being policed or informally policed by this kind of person, this kind of agency, and now they're not doing it. Hooray, that's a good outcome. But 
the newspaper is just wholly. Well, well let me ask you both this. Do we think that the idea of fact checking itself, the idea of there being any kind of uh, authority one could turn to to have a sense of what has actually happened in the world is just kind of dead in the modern era? The fact checking should not be the government. Yeah, well, it should not be the government. And then the fact checking industry has gotten really weird. Yeah, it has has a language that doesn't even sound like the like the the way they say disinfo and Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff is like, do you hear yourself? Facebook's fact checking is awful. It's as far worse than what Twitter does, in my view. Facebook's fact checking is the worst of all. It's not even. It's not the company doing it. They they've hired. They they have designated fact checking organizations that are many of them. Some of them are conservative, but many of them are just like left wing activist environmental oh, and COVID ex- groups. Explicitly white supremacists. I saw a clip recently of AOC skewering uh, um, Mark Zuckerberg over some pretty pernicious. You know, not just. I'm calling you racist, but like expressly white supremacist site so that we're all on the rolls as fact checkers over at Facebook. Yeah, face, Facebook's fact checking is atrocious. So the entire, the entire uh, fact checking industry has really gone off the rails into just yeah. rank partisanship, um, and it's it's no, it is it is not. Something has gone wrong there. Honestly, it, it, in fact, I'm, I'm like less likely to try if I hear it's a it's a fact che- check from an official fact checking partner or a fact checking organization. Like you know, those people are the are the most like the most ideological of all, the most yeah. hostile to to the right or to libertarians or to or to and really, it's a hostility to non governmental sources of information. Which you'd, you'd want fact checkers to fact check the lies of the government, but they are so often. They view the well. The government said that this is how it is. So you're very, right. how, you know, how dare you question that? Yeah, and you yeah. see that a lot. Part of it is the failure of and the collapse of the journalism industry, where there are no more independent journalists and in localities that people have a relationship to and know and love in their local paper, and who are doing that kind of independent reporting that serves their community. And another part of it, I think, Robbie, you're right. The same way that so many newspapers just print police reports without interrogating mm-hmm. that bias, yep. Yep. they print statements from press secretaries secretaries and and um, administrations as though that's just the factual truth. Right. You know, Jen Psaki was able to get up there on the podium so many times and just say, well, we don't think that we have the authority to cancel student debt until they FOIA'd a memo showing that they very well know that they have the authority to cancel student debt, right? And reporters on the whole never really pushed back against those kinds of flat and easily debunkable claims. So we are in a real crisis, and I'm not sure what to do about it, especially with journalism going the way it does and so little, re- so few resources going to the kind of independent reporting that's really necessary. I think the people are fact checking just fine, actually. I I mean, I don't think fact checkers and I don't mean fact checkers are fact checking just fine. I think we individual people are fact checking just fine because we're holding these fact checkers accountable for their lack of fact checking. Right. So like when it comes to the Hunter Biden laptop story, a lot of people just didn't listen to the fact checkers and they said, you know what, forget you. I'll make up my own mind. I'll listen to the facts myself. So I think the people can be trusted to fact check each and every story on their own, like we always have since the beginning of time, even when our crazy uncle lies to us and tells us tall tales. So it's like, now are we gonna be living in an era where where, uh, you you can't tell a kid, when I was in school back in the day and I used to have to walk up hills both ways for newspapers, for shoes, (laughs) and making up all kinds of stories without the kids saying to you, false, no, you are misinformation. (laughs) You are leading me tall tales. And, and part of the issue is there the fact checkers, the so many and so many journalists today are in such echo chambers of like minded people, of extremely of like radically like minded people, at least on our show, not to toot our own horn, like we have different some different ideological perspectives. So we can, you know, not exactly fact check each other, but challenge each other or, you know, press each other to to consider different arguments or at least understand what the other side says. And that is not something that happens in mainstream or progressive media media or to some extent not in conservative media as well they're kind of serving a fact checking role but there's not a lot of you know in, internal uh, debate the, the, those kinds of debates which were very common in the media only happening here on rising a little That's little right. plug for us <laughs> So tomorrow we will be speaking, uh, by the way, speaking of terrible fact checkers, uh, Facebook is censoring homemade baby formula recipes that are being shared by users on the site. Going to look at that. It's pretty, uh, pretty alarming uh, example of exactly what I was just talking about. And a new survey shows America's public schools lost at least 1.2 million students since 2020 with no signs of a rebound. We'll discuss that tomorrow. 
Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Also, be sure to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. You can check us out. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.